بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم گڈ ٹو سی یو ونس اگین وتھ لیکچر سکسٹین آف ڈراما ٹو دیٹ از ماڈرن ڈراما ان آر پریویس لیکچر وی اسٹارٹیڈ آر ٹاک اباؤٹ دی سمری آف دا پلے دیٹ از ویٹنگ فار گوڈو بائی سیمل بیکٹ اینڈ وی اسٹارٹیڈ آر سمری ڈسکشن ہاؤ ایور ود انالیسس اینڈ وی کوڈ ڈسکس ایکٹ ون with the introduction and Pozo and Lucky's entrance. And today we have to continue with our discussion of the same sort and we will see how far we can go in our discussion. Uh, we know that um, Valetimir and Estragon are constant characters, uh, pr constantly present on stage all the time. So it's basically this pair of Pozo and Lucky that makes any movement of entrance and exit. So we discussed um, act 1 where Pozo and Lucky they entered into the scene and we critically analyzed the situation as well. Now uh, where we left last time was when they were uh, exiting the scenario. Let's see how we are going to continue with it. So first I summarize and then I uh, try to uh, critically analyze the content. Um, I, I am positive that you would have your notes as well um, to add with minds and see how does it um, 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 you know add into the meaning production based on um, waiting for Godo by Samuel Beckett in the particular kind of scenario that he wrote this uh, play in. So uh, after Pozo and Lucky depart um, the situation, Valetimir once again tells Estragon that they cannot leave because they are waiting for Godo. Now we find that um, um, again Valetimir has taken the same position in the, in, um, in, the, in the same act when before Pozo and Lucky entered the scene there was a kind of shift of opinion between two of these characters. At one point we find Estragon wanting to leave and Valetimir stopping him. Then we, at another point we, we, we saw that Valetimir wanted to leave and Estragon stopped him somehow. And now again Valetimir is um, telling Estragon that they cannot leave because they are waiting for Godo. They argue about whether Pozo and Lucky have changed and Estragon suddenly complains of pain in his other foot. Uh, we see that they are talking about Pozo and Lucky now once they are not there and Estragon suddenly talks about some kind of pain in his foot for no reason. Uh, this pain, this uh, Pain is symbolic as well. A boy enters timidly saying that he has a message from Mr. Godo. A boy is again symbolic as messenger. It's not a man, it's not any other character but a boy, um, uh, a young child and then a young child enters timidly. His behavior is symbolic too. And he, this becomes more symbolic. This, uh, this fact attaches more significant with this um, phenomenon when we get to know that this boy has entered the scenario as a messenger, messenger from Godo who has already been uh, associated with a godlike figure, a figure who keeps some religious authority. And Estragon bullies the boy who reveals that he has been waiting a while but was afraid of Pozo and Lucky. Now Estragon is, you know, um, making boy a little, uh, finding that boy is already, already timid. He is bullying with him. Um, and boy, um, with the passage of time, reveals that he has been there since a while. However, he has been waiting for Pozo and Lucky to leave or he was kind of afraid of them. When Estragon, when, when Estragon shake the boy, uh, shakes the boy, um, badgering him to tell the truth, Valdemir yells at him and sits down and begins to take off his boots. We find Estragon behaving little, um, little um, notorious here because initially he's bullying with the boy and then he's shaking the boy a physical violence that he is uh, kind of enacting there in order to make the boy reveal the truth um, 
and then we find Venetimir again holding up that philanthropic, um, uh, taking philanthropic stance and yelling at um, Estragon for his behavior, rude behavior towards bo boy. However, very soon he um, he uh, indulges himself into a useless activity of you know taking off his boots once again. So this uh, this 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 gush of attitudes whether they are um, uh, they are for the benefit of humanity or for they are they are of anguish they are of love they are of kindness and then very soon they they are they are swept by either um, some kind of embarrassment or some useless activity is uh, again significant to discuss the the kind of uh, environment that the writer is creating in this play and this will help these events will help us in the end when we are an, uh, analyzing our themes and when we are putting them down together uh, to make them categorize into main uh, themes of the play these events will help us to substantiate our statements and um, tell us what really uh, is presented and um, conveyed by the writer meanwhile Velatimi talks to the boy now we we know that Estragon is being little um, um, you know um, unfriendly with the boy. We see Velatimi taking up his role of uh, a kind person who is talking to the boy. He asks him if he's in the he was the one who came yesterday, but the boy tells him that he's not the one. The boy tells Velatimi that Mr. Godo will not come this evening, but that he will surely come tomorrow. Velatimi then asks the boy if he works for Mr. Godo, and the boy tells him that he minds uh, the the goats. The boy says that Mr. Godo does not beat him, but that he beats his brother who minds the sheep. Well, this is a kind of irrelevant illogical nonsense kind of talk that is conversation that is going on between these two characters well to meet in the boy well to meet insisting boy and asking him again and again whether they met before or not and boy tells them that they did not see him before and that it's the first time that he's conveying this message to them and that is that mr godo will not come today as well and that um, when boy, when Velatimi asks the boy if he works for Mr. Godo, um, he gives a kind of irrelevant answer, telling that he does not. He minds goats, and um, that Mr. Godo does not beat him, but he beats his own brother who minds the sheep. Well, moving on, uh, Velatimi asks the boy if he's unhappy for certain reason, but the boy does not know. Veltimir inquiring boy about his feelings, very private feelings of happiness or unhappiness and the boy telling him straight away that he does not know about it, um, showing what kind of portrayal of character he is who does not keep any, um, any um, faculty of thinking of deciding what he feels or if he is able to, he is not able to share it. He tells the boy that he can go and that he is to tell Mr. Godo that he saw them. The boy runs off the stage and as he goes, it suddenly becomes night. As soon as the boy is off, we see the um, time changes into night. It's, it's light is gone, hope is gone. So the, the boy maybe is a kind of a symbol of hope here. And since it's a boy, it's not a man, so it can be understood as um, as a very small ray of hope, or it's a very um, a little possibility of uh, something happening, something positive happening. However, it does not happen again and again. And um, Estragon gets up and puts his boots down at the end of the uh, edge of the stage. Veldemi tells him that the boy assured him that Godo will come tomorrow. Um, Estragon putting on his boot, taking them off, now putting them on, uh, on the, um, at the edge somewhere um, on the stage. And then Veldemir assuring um, Estragon that Godo will come tomorrow because the boy said it so um, is a kind of situation that calls our attention. He tries to drag Estragon off stage to shelter, but Estragon will not go. Estragon 
wonders if they should part, but they decide to go together. As the curtain falls, they remain still. So, three, four things happening together. We see that Valdemir taking up a role of a caretaker for Estragon and, and dragging him off the stage to provide him shelter. Dragging him means doing something against Estragon's will. He's not willing to do it. But the nobility of um, and Valdemir's act is here that he wants to provide him shelter. But in order to do that, he has to do something against Estragon's will. But then we see that Estragon denies uh, and he does not want to go. And then Estragon is wonder if, he, if they need to part at this point. But they still stay together. And they are talking about going, but they remain still. And the curtain falls there. So, um, what issues come up here? How can we um, analyze the situation? Uh, if we critically analyze the situation, the section begins with the most commonly repeated dialogue in the play, in which Estragon wants to go and Veradami tells him that they are waiting for Godu. That is a constant reminder throughout the play of the activity that never takes place. Uh, this section provides evidence for a religious reading of the play as uh, Estragon compares himself to Christ when he decides to go barefoot. Well, uh, there are religious allusions. We, she we see that Godo um, was associated with sheep somehow. Then Estragon, initially he associated himself with Adam by calling himself Adam. And now he uh, creates some kind of association, build it up uh, with the Christ. And his deciding to go barefoot um, is again symbolic in nature. When Valadimi tells him not to compare himself to Christ, as he is doing that in black and white, it's not symbolic here. It is it is being done by the characters. Um, Estragon responds that all my life I have been compared myself to him. So it's strong realization that all his life he has been compared with this character. Valdemir's statement that he pretended not to recognize Pozo and Lucky suggests that he has met them before. Well, that is one very interesting thing. That Valdemir's statement that he pretended not to recognize the Pozo and Lucky is suggestive of the, uh, of the um, idea that he has already met them before. This indicates that the actions presented in the first act of the play may have happened before, calling attention to events that occur outside the frame of the play. The kind of reference that is coming from the um, past uh, of these characters, that showing that these characters met before, um, before then that day, which is being shown on the stage. However, they pretend that they never did. The same thing occurs when Valetimi asked the boy if he came yesterday, revealing that they were waiting yesterday with the same result. This suggests that the same events have been going on for some time and they are aware of the fact. The two acts of the play are merely two instances in a long pattern of carelessly repeating events. It's everything is almost the same. The end of Act 1 establishes Valdemir and um, Estragon's hopelessness. Even when the boy, when they, when they both agree to go and Valdemir says, yes, let's go, the two men do not move. Uh, hopelessness, nothingness, hollowness are the themes of the play we discussed in Juno and the Peacock as well. And these have been the themes of all the plays we discussed so far. But this play presents these themes so forcefully that they become the focal point to be conveyed by the writer. That everything is basically moving around this nothingness and hollowness of the life. Even their resolution to go is not strong enough to produce some action and they do not go, they never go. This inability, this inability to act renders Valadimir and Estragon unable to determine their own fates. Instead of acting, they can only wait for someone or something 
to act upon them. So they are not moving, they are not doing anything. If you can recall in the very beginning when we were discussing the characteristics of the modern, the writings of modern era, the styles, style of writing of modern times, the drama of modern times, we discussed that it's a kind of, it's a kind of um, escapism uh, practiced by these writers in their writing all the time. They very forcefully, um, very logically point out at things, sufferings, uh, pains, um, wrong things, wrongdoings and ills of society. However, um, they, are, they show their inability to fix it. They somehow um, present to be um, pretend to be cynical, um, one who is finding faults with things, but finds himself or herself unable to fix it up. Well, um, and with this we are finished with our discussion on Act 1 with the introduction and Pozo and Lucky's entrance and exit. And now we are entering into Act 2 and starting with our introduction uh, with Pozo and Lucky's entrance again on the stage. Act 2 takes place the next evening. At the same time and place, the tree now has four or five leaves on it. So there is a little, very minimal change in the, um, in the setting of the play. In the setting of the play, where estragons, um, where we see, the, now what is the change? We see that it's the same road, it's the same tree. However, just one day after, it's the next day, that tree now has four or five leaves on it. Well, um, again irrationality of the thing. Estragon's boots and Lucky's hat remain on stage when Vladimir enters. Looks around and begins to sing. Now, Lucky's, um, Estragon's boots and Lucky's hat are both symbolic. Um, and then we see that Vladimir, when he enters, he is singing. His song is, his singing is again symbolic. Estragon enters and suggests that Vladimir seemed happier without him. Estragon is in a way complaining that although Vladimir has been suggesting and has been assuring him that he cannot survive without him or uh, kind of um, pretending it, he seems happy without him. He says that he does not know why he keeps returning to Vladimir since he too is happier alone. They both are telling that they are happier alone. They both talk of, uh, talk about um, departing again and again, but somehow they keep remain together. But Vladimir insists that he, it's because Estragon does not know how to defend himself. They both are fighting on useless things, making useless comments. Vladimir suggests that things have changed since yesterday. What is the change? But Estragon does not remember yesterday. Now Estragon seems to forget everything, whatso whatever's happened so far. Um, and however, Vladimir keeps the memory of change. However, what changes this and how true is the memory is a question. Vladimir reminds him about Pozo and Lucky. Now, Vladimir, Vladimir is keeping up his memory to some extent and reminding Estragon about Pozo and Lucky they met yesterday. And they begin to argue about whether Estragon has ever been in the Macon country. Estragon once again says that it would be better if they parted. But Vladimir reminds him that he always comes crawling back. So, uh, they decide to converse calmly but soon run out of things to say and Vladimir grows uncomfortable with this silence. Well, we find Vladimir has a kind of uh, feeling of uh, um, discomfort with silence staying between them. And instead of being silent, he would like to speak something nonsense. Uh, so, um, Although they, they try to uh, keep some calm in their conversation, but very soon they find that there is nothing much to speak about and they get into silence. However, we find Vladimir never likes it and he always shows his discomfort. So, um, now Vladimir looks at the tree and notices that it is now covered with leaves, although yesterday it was bare. So this is shown in the drama in characters taking notice of it. Estragon says that it must be spring, but also insists that they were not here yesterday. 
Estragon is still keeping up his statement that he never he was never there before and that the leaves are there because it's spring now change of weather in a in a night time is how rational it is it's a question again Valetimi reminds him of the bones that Pozo gave him and the kick that Lucky gave him and shows him the wound on his leg. Valetimir giving him the reasons, the logic um, and reminding him of the past and um, he reminds him of the misery that he, uh, he has gone through um, when Pozo offered him bones and Lucky gave him a kick and reel and he also showed him the evidence on his leg. He asks Estragon where his boots are and even Estragon replies that he must have thrown them away, points out the boots on the stage trumpetly, telling that he has thrown them away and then telling him, showing him that they are put they are uh, over there on the stage at one point um, is very funny in fact. So um, it's Estragon who is presenting a, an entire change in his personality where he um, where he pretends or he really is um, is uh, is not able to recall anything of his past and the past is of uh, last day. Estragon however examines the boots and says when Veritimi tells him and asks him about his boots he says that he, th he, uh, he has thrown them away. Um, Estragon examines the boots who, which are lying on the stage and says that they are not his. Valetimi reasons that someone must have come by and exchanged his boots for Estragon's. If they are not of Estragon's, then somebody will definitely be owning them. And if it's someone else's boots, then someone has definitely visited the place uh, except them. Valetimir, gree, uh, Valetimir gives Estragon a black reddish but since he only likes the pink ones he gives it back. Estragon says he will go and get a carrot but he does not move. Giving something to eat to Estragon knowing that he does not like it and he gives it back and Estragon says that he will go and get a carrot but he does not move at all. Valadimir suggests uh, trying the boots on Estragon and they fit, but Estragon does not want them laced, want them tied. Estragon sits down on the on the mound and tries to sleep. Valetimir sings him a lullaby and he falls asleep, but soon wakes up from a nightmare. Um, we get to know that he already had a nightmare before in Act 1, which he wanted to share with Valadimir, but he could never um, share it because Valadimir never wanted to listen to it, calling them private nightmares. Now again Valadimir, when, uh, when he um, sings a comforting song to Estragon and he falls into a sleep, he wakes up from a nightmare. Valadimir is pleased to, so this dream is again a, a a symbol here as and dream is not a happy dream it's a nightmare all the time. Veritimir is pleased to find Lucky's hat on the ground because he believes it confirms that they are in the correct place because he's the one who um, is able to recall his meeting with their meeting with Lucky and Pozo and now he has apart uh, the evidence of um, of wound on Estragon's leg. The other evidence he can collect is uh, Lucky's hat on the ground that assures him he they had visited. He puts on Lucky's hat and hands uh, his to Estragon, uh, who takes off his hat and hands it to Valadmir. This switch occurs several times until once again Valadmir wears Lucky's hat and Estragon wears his own hat. Valadmir decides that he will keep Lucky's hat since his brotherhood, um, since his brothered him. Okay, so now they are exchanging their hats uh, with one another and this happens several times. And in the end, Valadmir is um, keeping Lucky's hat and Estragon is wearing his own hat. And he gives a reason, Valadmir gives a reason. Um, of keeping his head on is that um, he has brother uh, since uh, he he says that his own hat is bothering him so he will keep Lucky's hat on so they begin to play Pozo and Lucky's role now when Veritimir has his uh, Lucky's cap on he's playing Lucky's role um, 
And so Veldemir is imitating Lucky and telling Estragon what to do to imitate Pozo. And he is instructing um, his friend uh, Estragon how to imitate Pozo. Estragon leaves but quickly returns because he hears someone coming. So again hope is there. Veldemir is sure that Godo is coming and Estragon hides behind the tree. They both are there to meet Godo, but when Godo is about to come or they think that he is coming, Estragon is hiding himself behind the tree, is a symbolic act. He realizes that he is not hidden and comes out, and the two men being, uh, begin a watch with one, sta one stationed on each other of the stage. When they both begin to speak at once, they get angry and begin insulting each other for no reason. After they finish their insults, they decide to make up an embrace. They are fighting, they are embracing each other, they are loving each other, taking care of each other, fighting with each other, throwing each other away, all kinds of acts that are possible they are doing on the stage, but keeping the same thing that they are waiting for someone to come. They briefly do some exercises and then do uh, the tree uh, staging around on one foot, staggering around on one foot. So what, what comes out of this discussion is that Valdemir's song about the dog who stole a crust of bread repeats itself perp perp perpetually. The two verses follow each other in succession so that it can be sung forever. Although Hey Valdemir only sings each verse twice. Now this this figure, the the doing things for two times, two characters, two acts, two repetitions, is symbolic. The song is a rep representation of the rep repetitive nature of the play as a whole, um, as a whole, and of Valdemir's and Estragon's circular lives as well. Like the verses of the song, the events of their lives follow one after another, again and again, with no apparent beginning or end or change. The hat switching incident is another illustration of the endless, often mindless repetition that seems to characterize the play. All these incidents are basically adding into the themes that we somehow identified in the very beginning of the discussion. Like Valdemir's song, at the beginning of Act 2, the hat switching could go on perpetually and only stops when Valdemir decides um, arbitrarily to put an end to it, just an abrupt end. Valdemir and Estragon's discussion about the noise made by all the dead voices brings back the theme of Estragon's repeating himself to end a string of conversation. Three times in a row, Estragon repeats his phrase with silence following each repetition. Estragon's repetition of the phrase, like leaves, and they rustle, emphasizes these phrases, especially since Estragon comes back to like leaves in the third part of the discussion again. So, presence of silence and a particular presence of silence in a repetitive act is symbolic. In this section, we see again that Valdemir's desire to protect Estragon, he is very protective of his partner. He believes that the primary reason Estragon returns to him every day, despite his declaration that he's, he's, uh, he's happier alone, is that he needs Valdemir to help him and defend him. And Valdemir says it, showing that he is very well uh, aware of his need of protecting him. Whether or not Valdemir actually does protect Estragon while, and he shows this while he was, uh, while, while, when he wants to drag him off the stage to shelter him. Valdemir clearly feels that this duty and responsibility defines their relationship. Now, Estragon's statement that he will go and get a um, carrot followed by the stage directions. He does not move at all. Saying something and doing altogether opposite recalls their immobility in Act 1's conclusion and is another illustration of the way that the characters do not act on their words or intention. As I discussed earlier, it's a, a we also saw this uh, this technique of mirrorism in um, 
um, Sean O'Kessa's work too. Uh, and we see the same thing happening here in Samuel Beckett's work. Well, it amuse recognizes this problem after he decides that they should try on the boots. He says impatiently, let us preserve in what we have resolved before we forget. They understand that they are forgetting things. Well, it amuse clear awareness of his own problem makes his inability to solve it, to act and to move. Um, it seems even more frustrating and unfathomable. Okay, when Valetumir and Estragon, again we are moving with the development of the plot, when Valetumir and Estragon stagger about um, pitying themselves, Pozo and Lucky enter once again. Pozo is blind and runs into Lucky, who has stopped at the sight of Valetumir and Estragon. They fall um, along with all the baggage they have. Well, to me, now we know when the second entrance takes place, um, the master is um, blind and the slave is dumb. And they are still together. Well, to me, welcomes their arrival since it will help to pass the time once again. It is reminding us of the statement that Valdemir made in the first act. Pozo calls for help while Valdemir and Estragon discuss asking him for another bone. Uh, now, they both are convinced of his meeting somehow indirectly by asking him for another bone. Valetimi decides that they should help him, but first he and Estragon discuss how they have kept their appointment. Pozo continues to cry for help. He's crying for help and he's not getting any help. Despite the fact that these characters who are being called upon for help are discussing how to help and what to help, uh, they are not doing it. And eventually, Valetimi tries to assist him. He tries to help him. However, he falls also while trying to pull up Pozo. He is unable to help him up. Estragon threatens to leave. Uh, but Valetimi begs him to help him up first. Now Valetimi needs Estragon's assistance to stand back, promising that they will leave together afterwards. Estragon tries to help him up but ends up falling as well. Estragon's inability. And both of these characters dependability on each other. Now all four of these men, Estragon, Valetimir, Pozo and Lucky are on the ground and Valetimir and Estragon begin to nap and they have, they, once they are unable to get up and stand back, they begin to nap now. Um, they are woken shortly by Pozo's shouting and Valetimir strikes Pozo to make him stop. But it's a, it's a, it's a madhouse now. Pozo crawls away. Pozo is crawling away and Valetimir and Estragon call to him uh, and he does not respond and Estragon decides to try other names. He's trying him with different names. He calls out Abel and Pozo responds by crying for help. He responds back on a name that he, they never knew before. Uh, he wonders if the other one is called Cain but Pozo responds to that name as well and Estragon decides that he must be all of humanity. Valetimir and Estragon decides to get up, which they do with ease. They help Pozo up and hold him and Pozo tells them that he does not recognize them since he is blind. They tell him that it is evening and then begin to question him about the loss of his sight. He tells them that it, it came upon him all of a sudden and that he has no notion of time. Uh, Pozo asks the men about his slave and they tell him that Lucky seems to be sleeping. This, they send Estragon over to Lucky and Estragon begins kicking Lucky. He hurts his foot and goes to sit down. We are reminded of Lucky's kick to Estragon. Now Estragon is kicking Lucky but he hurts his foot. Valetimir asks Pozo if they met yesterday but Pozo does not remember. So Estragon does not remember, Pozo does not remember either. Pozo prepares to leave and Valetimir asks him to have Lucky sing or recite before they leave. However, Pozo tells him that Lucky is dumb, Lucky cannot hear anymore. They exit and Valetimir sees them fall, fall off stage. 
Well, it seems um, quite an interesting situation when you would find that this play is mere repetition of few meaningless acts and um, there is no, no, nothing much in this play however this discussion is going on and on and on suggesting that these meaningless nothing uh, to do with acts are um, pregnant with meaning and loads and loads of meaning well uh, once again coming back to discussion we find these characters pretending to be unaware um, pretending to be um, illogical and nonsense however they are aware of the things very well here again Vladimir seems to recognize the problem of inaction when he decides that uh, that they should help Pozo since Pozo is still crying and he becomes suddenly vehement and shouts Vladimir is shouting this let us not waste our time in idle discourse let us do something while we have the chance this call to action seems like an urgent relay against the trend of inaction he and Estragon have been following throughout the play. However, Veritamir still takes plenty of time to begin to help Pozo to his feet. This suggests that even with good intentions and resolution, the habit of inaction cannot be broken immediately. One more thing that we notice is that previously Estragon and Veritamir, when they both fell down, they thought uh, that without each other's help uh, they cannot get up back and they tried and they could not do so however when they had to they do it with quite um, an ease and they stood up back on their feet in this speech Veritamir when he's uh, shouting and he is um, cursing themselves for being um, for wasting their time he also declares that at this point all mankind is us whether we like it or not this is what we are this continues the theme of Valetumir and Estragon's representation of mankind as a whole and shows that Valetumir is himself aware of, his, of this comparison. Now one thing to be noticed here, when they are representing humanity and that's what Samuel Beckett representing here is, they are representing only one gender, that is male gender. We do not find any female character in the story. So three plays that we have, two plays that we have covered so far are all dealing with um, writers who had feministic approach of writing. We read uh, Juno's character, we read Nora's character. These were the characters who were written to strengthen women image um, in, the, in the world, uh, in the background of World War and Irish War. However, in this play, there is no female character altogether uh, and this is considered a true representation of humanity Estragon also illustrates the peril between the two men and the rest of humanity when he tells Valdemir that billions of people can also claim that they have kept their appointment now who are these billions of people are these two characters Pozo and Lucky so they are reinforcing their own statement of considering themselves total humanity. In this case, Valtimir attempts to distinguish them from the rest of mankind, but Estragon insists that they are actually the same and there is no difference. And another biblical allusion is presented here through the comparison of Pozo and Lucky to Cain and Abel. However, when Pozo responds to the names Cain and Abel, Estragon decides that he is all humanity. This suggestion indicates one, once more that the characters in the play represent the human race as a whole. Now, Valdemir needs of Estragon's help in order to get um, up his somewhat of a role reversal for a brief exchange Extragon holds the power in the relationship as Valtimir calls to him for help however when Estragon does finally um, stretch out his hand to help Valtimir up he only falls himself this seems to indicate that Estragon does not belong in this position of power of helping and responsibility and cannot act to fulfill it, fulfill it accordingly. After Pozo and Lucky leave, Valetumir wakes Estragon. Estragon is upset at being wake, woken up. 
but Veladimir tells him that he was alone. The, so this theme of loneliness. Estragon gets up but his feet hurt because he kicked uh, Lucky. So he sits down again and tries to take off his boots which he uh, put on somewhere uh, in the previous uh, scene. Meanwhile, Veltimi reflects upon the events of the day. Estragon dozes off again after unsuccessfully struggling with his boots and he's not able to tie his boots um, as always. The boy enters and calls to Veltimir. Veltimir recognizes the routine and knows what the boy is going to say before he says it. So monotony is very well played in this play. They established that the boy was not there yesterday. They finally decided. But that he has a message from Mr. Goro saying that he will not come this evening as well, but definitely tomorrow. So an ongoing wait with a definite promise that never fulfills. Veritimir asks the boy what Mr. Goro does, and the boy replies that he does nothing. The same question, the same answer. But however, this time the fact is established that they really don't know the boy. Veladimir asks the boy about his brother. However, he remembers about the brother, about the brother that the boy mentioned, the, mentioned yesterday that he's the one who's beaten by Godo. And the boy tells him that his brother is sick. Veladimir asks if Mr. Godo has a beard and what color it is. Now, uh, why Veladimir felt the need of it? Uh, asking that whether Godo has a beard or not, and what color it is, what what does it what matter, uh, what relevance it has with the character. The boy asks Valdemir what he should tell Mr. Godo and Valdemir tells him that he should say that he saw him. The boy runs away as Valdemir springs toward him. There isn't any message from these two men. It's only that they want him to tell the Godo that he met them. The sunset, Estragon waken, wakes up, um, takes off his boots once again and puts them down at the front of the stage. He, he approaches Valadimir and tells him that he wants to go. Valadimir tells him that they cannot go far away because they have to come back tomorrow to see the Goro because Goro will be waiting for them. They discuss hanging themselves from the tree but find that they are unable to do it. Estragon tells Valdemir that he can't go on like this and Valdemir tells him that they will hang themselves tomorrow unless Godo comes. And they decide to go but once again they do not move and it's a similar repetition of the same kind of acts. So by this point in this play the dialogue about writing for Godo has been repeated so many times uh, that even Estragon knows it. Every time he asked Faradumi to go previously, they went through the entire dialogue about why they could not go. So this suggests that this dialogue has occurred many times before and further furthers the indication that the play is just a representation, sample of the large circle of repetition of similar kind of activities. And these activities relate to Faradumi's and Estragon's life lives which are basically representing the whole mankind, humanity as a whole. So the play's conclusion echoes the end of Act 1. Um, even the stage directions reflect the similarity after boys exit and the, and the uh, moon rise, the stage directions said, uh, uh, read as in Act 1, Veritamir stands motionless and bowed. However, the characters have switched lines from the previous act, uh, suggesting that ultimately, despite their differences, Veritamir and Estragon are really interchangeable after all. It's all the same, and they are representing humanity as whole. So this was all about the play, all the development, and all the themes that um, writer uh, conveyed through his writing. Okay, now we will discuss some of the questions and I will try to give you some stingers to think about them. 
will give you some suggestions. So um, by the time when we next meet for next lecture, you are prepared with your points on these questions. And when we are discussing the, the presence of themes in the play in detail with the relevance of dramatic references, um, the symbols and all the other aspects that are to be discussed, uh, you are able to comprehend them and you are able to add into them with the help of your own notes and the meanings that you produced so far. So, um, one type of question is that asks about what do you think is the most effective way that Beckett presents repetition in waiting for Godot? And whatever we discussed, you would understand now, uh, makes sense that why we discuss it in such detail. Again, the same thing is uh, um, suggested in, the, in, the, in, in another question. If the play is meant as a representation symbol of what happens every night in the lives of Velitimir and Estragon, why does Beckett choose to present two acts instead of three or one? Again, the repetition cycle. Why do you think it is repetition in Waiting for Godot and what kind of representation and what does it um, convey? Now, some suggestions for this answer. Um, the presentation of essentially uh, the same action twice in the two acts is the most important form of repetition in the play. You see this repetition of twice is everywhere. The characters are in pairs. The acts are in, uh, the acts are in a, in a pair, and things are happening either twice or more than twice. So you have to look into it. More than one act is necessary to show the repetition of actions in the play, but this does not explain why Beckett chooses to use two acts instead of more than two. The choice of two acts may be somehow related to the use of pairs of characters emphasizing the importance of characters and actions that occur in twos. Alright, um, then the other question can be, describe the relationship between Vladimir and Estragon. What do you think, what kind of relationship both of these characters keep? Why do you think they stay together? Why do you think they are uh, dependent on each other. Are they dependent or they are independent? Do they need each other or can they survive without each other? Despite their frequent suggestions of parting, why don't they part? So this is all what we discussed in our uh, in today's talk in lecture 16. However, still to remind you of some of the important things, some critics have suggested that Valetimir and Estragon uh, remain together because of their complementary personalities because they both ca both are interchangeable personalities arguing that each fulfills the qualities that the other lacks rendering them depend on each other so dependency and interchangeability is one reason think about what evidence there is in the play for this type of interpretation so uh, I'm going back to uh, the same thing that I discussed in lecture 14 probably that whatsoever meaning that you produce it has to have some background logical background based on the evidence from the drama so if you say that dependency is one reason or complementary personality is another reason bring out the references from the from the play and the text and then base your discussion on that okay um, some other questions the two most important sets of characters in the play occur in pairs. Valdemar and Ext uh, Valdemir and Extragon and uh, Pozo and Lucky. Does this emphasize on pairs create some significance for the boy who appears alone? We find boy um, being one character or and Godo being one character. So what is the relevance between this pair, uh, pair significance and uh, this solo significance of these characters? these characters. Valentinian and the boy discuss his brother. Could this brother be the boy's pair? Perhaps the most important character in the play Godo is also a single character uh, rather than a pair. Does this distinguish him from Valentinian and Estragon, Pozo and Lucky? Is there any difference between these two pairs and Godo? Does Beckett seem to prefer single characters or pairs? 
How does the relationship between Velatimir and Estragon compare with the relationship between Pozo and Lucky? The difference, the comparison of relationships between both pairs. What is the effect created by the contrast between these two pairs of characters? Is it significant that the characters appear in pairs rather than alone? So basically all of these questions are discussing uh, the same and similar things. So once you are preparing for one question, you are preparing for almost all the questions of the same sort. Um, some other questions can be, do you think the play warrants a religious reading? Can Godot be considered a Christ figure or, or simply a religious figure? If so, what is implied by his failure to appear? Why doesn't he appear? What about Estragon's attempts to equate himself with Christ? Well, consider also the, the many biblical allusions throughout the play, such as the mention of Cain and Abel and the discussion of the story of the two thieves from the Gospels. Though it seems as if nothing happens in the play, action usually play a very important role in waiting for Godo. The stage directions of the play constitute nearly half of the text, suggesting that the actions, expressions and emotions of the actors are as important as the dialogues. So the pauses and silences are replaced by the actions, emotions and dialogues. What, signif what significance it has. Examine the significance of the stage directions of one particular scene. For example, why is Estragon always struggling with his boots? Or what, uh, what significance um, the exchange of hats has in um, the second act? I am giving you an idea of different types of question that can, that can come up in your assessment when you are asked to um, describe your uh, opinions about it. So you can, all the discussion that we did today, if you form it down into uh, different categories, you will see that all these questions are basically answered there. Uh, what is the significance of Pozo's vaporizer spray, you remember? What is the point of the scene in which Vladimir and Astrogron exchange hats eight times? So, um, and few more questions. Beckett called his play a tragic comedy. Do you agree with this classification? If not, how would you classify the play and why would you do that? Do you think the play contains more elements of tragedy or comedy so that, that it be called either a comedy or a tragedy? Well, what is memory's role in the play? Why do so many of the characters uh, memories seem to be erased each day? Well, that's very valid question. In fact, all of these are very valid questions. Uh, Veritimir seems to be the only character who remembers things from the day to the next. What is the purpose of having one character remembering what all of the others forget? What can be a reason? Okay. Um, and the last uh, slide for question is, what is the overall tone of the play? Is the reader left with a feeling of resignation that Godo will never come and Maladimir and Estragon will continue to wait in vain? Or is there some hope created in the end of the play? Or the play ended with, without, with any hope or uh, in despair? Do the changes in Pozo and Lucky's uh, lucky between the first and second acts, the change in um, Pozo getting blind and Lucky getting dumb, acts contribute to an overall feeling of hopelessness? What about the changes in the tree, the appearance of four or five leaves? The coming of spring often suggests hope for the future. Is this the case here? Well, all these questions, whether, um, if, in fact, although they are answered in today's discussion, if you, um, if you categorize them under different sections, however, we will be coming back to them again and again during our discussions of different aspects from the drama, uh, basically of themes and symbols. When we are discussing them, you will see that we will collect more and more facts and evidences to prove our statements. However, I want you to 
put these questions down and think about them and collect evidences now when you start with your second reading of the play. And I am sure when I meet you next time, you'll be done with your second reading and the third reading will help you cover everything that can be uh, there in order to um, check your um, understanding and interpretation of the play. So what we did in today's talk, basically, we summarized successfully Wedding for Goro, written by Samuel um, Beckett. We also analyzed it and we analyzed uh, the entrance and exit and, and sustenance of some characters on the stage. We discussed some of the very important discussion questions and some aspects to be analyzed in our following lectures for this play. I will see you in the, in the 17th lecture now. By then, Allah Hafiz.